Welcome everyone this evening. My name is John Short. I'm Dean and CEO here at UW Fond du Lac. And we're very pleased to sponsor tonight's event. Tonight we're having a conversation on the state of politics in America, featuring our own Congressman Tom Petri of Wisconsin's 6th Congressional District and retired Congressman Dave Obey of Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District. Before I introduce tonight's moderator, who will make some remarks and introductions, I'd like to call attention to the importance of civic learning, civic engagement, and citizen involvement at all levels of politics. Last night, the UW Fond du Lac Student Government Association sponsored a candidate forum for the Fond du Lac City Council. Local citizens were able to hear from each of the candidates on why they were running for city council, what they thought were the most important issues facing the city of Fond du Lac, and respond to, question, respond to the questions from panelists as well as the audience. In that historic forum, citizens were able to learn about politics, about candidates, to get the information that they needed to vote in such an important election. We're committed to working with the community groups now and in the future to promote civic knowledge about candidates, issues, and the importance of being involved in your community. As a campus, we're committed to civic engagement through service learning, through internships for our students, through a curriculum that stresses civic learning, and opportunities for our community members to take advantage of the resources of our campus. Recently, a national report entitled The Crucible Moment was released in this country, and the authors concluded in part, to be an American means to take responsibility for democratic processes, practices, vitality, and viability. But unlike liberty, civic knowledge and capability are not bestowed at birth. They are hard won through our education at all levels and through taking seriously the perspective of others. Democratic insight and competence are always in the making, always incomplete. Therefore, civic learning needs to be an integral component of every level of education from gra grammar school to graduate school, across all fields of study. It should also be an important part of our informal educational practices for young people and adults, woven into every community and region in the nation. The report, the report went on to talk about what civic engagement should be like, what civic learning should be like. And they went on to say that it should emphasize knowledge, critical reasoning, deliberation, bridge building across differences, collaborative decision making, open mindedness, civic problem skills, and civility and mutual respect. As we move into tonight's conversation, we confront those issues and we ask Congressman Petri and former Congressman Obi to, to keep that at the forefront of our concerns. How do, in fact, we have a civic body, a civic dialogue based on civility, mutual respect, and a focus on issues? How is it that these two congressmen, one a Democrat and one a Republican, could reach across the aisles and work together so well when they were in Congress? How can we move back to those kinds of ways of, of doing business? Why is it that, in fact, people distrust government? When we ask questions, how much do you trust government to do the right thing? Those levels of confidence have gone down. Why is that so? As we move into tonight's conversation, I would like to introduce Professor Don Schwartz, who is a member of our political science faculty. Professor Schwartz will, will be making remarks about uh, tonight's program and making introductions. I'd also like to thank Eric Giordano, who is here tonight, who is the Executive Director of WIPS, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy Studies. Eric, thank you so much. And Eric has brought some interns with him this evening, and we thank them. Uh, I certainly want to thank the Congressman for being here today and making this possible as we move ahead with a greater public understanding about the role of citizens in government, about the political process, and about how to make government work more for the people. At this point, I'd like to introduce Don Schwartz, who will make some remarks and introductions. Thank you.
Thank you, Dean Short. You always have invaluable and educational insight. It's, on, it's my honor to be here to moderate this conversation on the state of American politics with former Congressman Dave Olby and Congressman Tom Petray. Welcome. Uh, let me just say, Dave, as I mentioned to you earlier, you look the same as you did 28 years ago when I met you in your <laughs> office in Washington, D.C. <laughs> they all say that. <laughs> um, I was actually an intern uh, for the late right. Senator George ben or, um, Lloyd Benson, and I worked with his chief aide, George Tyler. Um, and at that time, you were the chairman of the Joint Economic Committee. So it's good to see you again. Thank you. Um, Congressman Petra, we've met a couple times over the years, and I'm pleased that we've been able to establish an internship program with your Fond du Lac office and UW Fond du Lac. Uh, it's a great opportunity for our students, and they're taking advantage of it every semester. So thank you for that. Um, according, believe it or not, the June 2013 edition of American History Magazine is already out. And according to this edition, uh, a recent poll found that the 113th Congress has a lower approval rating than root canals, colonoscopies, <laughs> cockroaches, or Genghis Khan. The partisanship gridlock that existed in the 112th Congress is alive and well in the 113th, with the primary, primary issue being should the federal government address the $16 trillion debt by reining in spending as the Republicans propose or, bur or by raising taxes on the very rich as the Democrats propose. Most people who follow government and care about public policy issues just want our leaders and legislators to compromise because after all, this is what our system was designed to do. Compromise is the heartbeat of our democracy. With that being said, our political history shows that compromise was the norm or way from the very beginning of our federal system in 1789 with regard to the issue of slavery. Compromise allowed our new constitution to get passed in 1787, which um, described American blacks at that time as three-fifths and having three-fifths of a person, three-fifths of um, uh, the vote. Yep. And then the compromises of 1820 and 1850, I bring those up because they were um, brought forward by Henry Clay, a longtime um, leader in the House of Representatives from Kentucky, like you both. He served in Congress for well over 30 years, and he really understood uh, the role of compromise. Um, but inevitably, uh, what compromise showed us with regard to slavery is that our it showed us what our system can do and can't do. But the most important thing about compromise is that for the most part, legislators on both sides of the aisle have always found a way to be friends for the most part, despite their political or ideological differences. Both of you are friends. And both have represented our state um, honorably and with great distinction for many decades. Also, uh, I, I've always been a fan of the Congress, and perhaps you both uh, know about this, the Board of Education that met from the beginning of the 19th century well into the 1950s. It's described as being held in a cubby hole in the Capitol where legislators from both parties, after arguing all day and being opposed to one another, would head down to that Board of Education, as they referred to it. Texas Jack Garner was one of the primary early people, Nicholas Longworth, Sam Rayburn, a little before your time. Um, well, they, had the, they had this uh, Texas Star in there. <laughs> yeah. And they would always drink a toast to liberty every night with whiskey and branch water, as they described it. Kind of like, I can't, I don't remember the name of the cartoon, but do you remember the cartoon where the wolf and the sheep would fight all day long? And at the end of the day, they would go to the tree and punch up, we'll see you tomorrow, Max, and do it all over again, kind of like you legislators. Let's fast forward to the 1980s when Democratic Speaker Tip O'Neill and Republican President Ronald Reagan could find a middle ground on a couple of public policy issues because they liked one another. And to the 1990s, we have evidence of our system working with Democratic President Bill Clinton taking office in 1993, 
the Republicans winning both houses of Congress in 94 for the first time in 40 years. And yes, the politics were rancid in the 90s like they are today. There were several presidential uh, independent investigations. There was an impeachment only for the second time in history. But if you look at the record and you uh, look at the economic times for the 1990s, many people are, many scholars are writing that the 1990s might be the best economic times in all of the 20th century for America. And that was a Republican Congress and a Democratic White House. Now, it didn't come easy, I know that, uh, but it does show that our system can work when uh, the two institutions want to work with one another. Then we had the, the beginning of the 21st century with the contested election of 2000, the 9-11 um, incident, two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, followed by the first African-American president being elected in 2008 and 2012. And the word compromise seems to be a dirty word today, you know, because we have 24-7 media coming at us, and depending on your ideological viewpoints on politics, you can have your uh, politics reinforced by watching Fox News if you believe that it's conservative and Republican, or you can have it reinforced watching MSNBC if you're liberal and Democratic. And CNS, CNN always tries to portray itself as being middle of the road. Um, but at, at any rate, I've been involved in politics for 32 years, and I've never seen it this bad in my time. Um, I haven't been elected in Washington, but I'm finishing my 10th year as an elected village trustee at Hales Corners. That is why we're here tonight, to hear and listen from two people who are friends from different political parties and ideologies, and as I mentioned earlier, who have long served the citizens of Wisconsin with great distinction. Let me begin by introducing Congressman Tom Petri. Tom Petri represents Wisconsin's 6th Congressional District and is serving his 18th term in the U.S. House of Representatives. First elected in April 79, when Jimmy Carter was president, Petrie has been returned to office every two years since. He is a longtime member of both the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and of the Committee on Education and Labor. He is the current chairman of the Subcommittee on Highways and Transit, which has jurisdiction over national surface transportation policy, construction and improvement of highway and transit facilities, implementation of safety and research programs, and regulation of commercial motor vehicle operations. Petri is also a member of the Subcommittee on Aviation, where he previously served as chairman, and the Subcommittee on Economic Development, Public Buildings, and Emergency Management. As a member of the Committee on Education and the Workforce, he is a member of the Subcommittee on Early Childhood, Elementary, and Secondary Education, and the Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Training. From 1987 to 1990, he served as a member of the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct, which is better known as the House, House Ethics Committee. Our first the Concord Coalition, Citizens Against Government Waste, Americans for Tax Reform, and the Watchdogs of the Treasury. Over many years, he has repeatedly been named a guardian of a small business by the National Federation of Independent Business and has won the National Security Leadership Award from the American Security Council. Petre is known for his efforts to apply innovative solutions to problems with a firm commitment to cost effectiveness. Accordingly, Norm, Norm Ornstein, a long prominent political scholar and expert on Congress, has called Petri one of the most thoughtful members of Congress, filled with lots of ideas about how to make government work better, while the late Washington Post the columnist David Broder called him a notably independent, creative legislator. Important Petri legislative uh, initiatives have included those in the areas of student loan reform, the federal highway program, cost sharing for federal water projects, tax and welfare reform, banking reform, campaign reform, and health care reform. He attended Goodrich High School in Fond du Lac and received undergraduate and law degrees from Harvard. He served in Somalia as a Peace Corps volunteer and in the White House focusing on anti-drug efforts. He's married to Anne Neo Petri and has one daughter, Alexandra. 
please welcome Congressman Tom Petra. Thank you, and uh, thank you all very much for coming to this, uh, this evening a discussion on this state of American politics and particularly our views on the role of the House of Representatives in that process. Uh, I hope the uh, evening will be both interesting and a little bit of fun. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Dave Obie here, who is a friend and who also has served uh, uh, in the, as a, during a big transition from the old days of the old lions where the committee chairman ran the roost in the House of Representatives and people who were speakers and others really uh, had important roles but no, were nowhere near as dominant as is the case today in, in either, either party. Uh, and uh, uh, I just would say a word or two before uh, uh, introducing Dave and then engaging in a, in a, in a conversation, and that is that uh, it's always uh, easy to lament change and talk about the difficulties that we uh, encounter today, but it's also important to remember that the House of Representatives is the people's house. It's a representative institution. There have been a lot of changes over the last 40 years. Uh, for example, the place has opened up. It's on TV. Uh, it used to be committees would meet secretly. They was involved in opening, opening this up. That's a two-edged sword, though. There's a lot of camaraderie behind closed doors, but when people are disagreeing and it's on TV, when they're from different parties and it's on TV and their supporters may not understand because they think they're selling out or something, they need to sometimes publicly portray the adversarial role more than it really uh, may actually uh, it exist. Uh, in any event, uh, the House is, a, is the, the, I think, the key institution under our Constitution and in our uh, Republic. It's evolved and will continue to evolve. It faces a lot of challenges. Uh, and I would throw out one or two ideas that Dave, I think, might well disagree with this, but I, he was there when I, uh, before I got there, and I was elected just when they switched from uh, the old roll call voting to electronic voting. Now, uh, if you go to the uh, state legislature or the U.S. Senate, the state Senate or the U.S. Senate, they call the na names of all the 100 senators or 33 senators. They did that in the House of Representatives throughout all of our history until the mid-1960s. And then as an efficiency move, I guess, they decided they would have electronic voting so people could go and push their card. The trouble with that is they ended up, uh, I don't think necessarily saving any time that was very valuable. They did create a lot of Mickey Mouse votes and thousands of votes when before there were only votes on major substantive issues when there was disagreement. And, and uh, it was the case in those days, people could sometimes arrange to manage legislation through where they agreed what needed to be done, but the politics of it were difficult, so they could voice vote things or have standing votes, as of now it's almost impossible. So that gives a little less slack in the system than we used to have. But that's just one, one observation. Uh, uh, it's much more in immediate now because of the communications have changed. It's no longer weeks. It's instantaneous from the floor of the house to every everyone's iPod uh, or or a computer. And how we we manage to have an intermediating and representative body, and yet uh, uh, manage that process given the immediacy of the communications is a challenge and something that we, we have to recognize is just just as a fact. Uh, Dave Obey is a uh, legend in his own time. He's elected to the State Assembly with my predecessor, I think, Bill Steiger, in 1962, after he and his wife uh, uh, graduated from the University of Wisconsin, almost immediately after. Uh, he had a very uh, distinguished career in the state uh, legislature. Uh, in fact, interestingly enough, was instrumental in in creating the modern vocational uh, uh, system, uh, or the outlines of the designs of it in our state, and a number of other, uh, the, and the, the state broadcasting setup that, that we have, have today. 
uh, when Mel Laird was appointed by Richard Nixon at, uh, at a difficult time as Secretary of Defense, uh, Dave was elected to succeed him. And uh, uh, in those days, in, in Wisconsin politics, people with strong differences often were very good friends. They, they served the legislature <coughs> together, Mel Laird, uh, and your biographer didn't mention this, but he said that the, the Obi family had a sort of a watering hole that uh, a lot of the local mm -hmm. Democrats in the Wausau area would gather at. He was a Republican congressman, but he always made it a point when he was in town to stop by and have a drink and talk about what was going on and how, how young Dave's career was uh, coming, coming along. And, and he's always taken an interest in it, and they've worked together over the years, despite differences on a lot of issues, on, still on issues that affect uh, north central Wisconsin, such as the Marshall Clinic and the research there and so on, which Laird was very instrumental in and Obie's been very uh, mm -hmm. instrumental in. Uh, they, they, uh, two of their best friends uh, for Laird and for uh, Obie both were uh, Gaylord Nelson, who's a kind of a mentor and idol of all of us in, in Wisconsin politics of a certain, certain generation. Uh, Dave served uh, uh, with distinction uh, from 1969 to 2010, longest serving member of the House of Representatives in the history of the state of Wisconsin, on the key economic uh, committees, chairman of the powerful uh, appropriation uh, committee, and he was regarded during his years there as a uh, man of the house in that he believed very strongly, obviously, in particular positions and ideas and goals and things that needed to be done for, for justice for uh, people in our society. But he also believed very strongly in the importance of the House of Representatives and it functioning as a true representative uh, of democracy. So we're very happy to have him here, and I won't step on his lines anymore, just except to say, when I was first elected, I got a telephone call from someone, and it was Dave Obie, saying, I hear you, and he, he actually, I think one of his fellows working in his district office, he can't work to try to get, not, not get elected, but that's <laughs> politics. And, and he called me up and said, well, you got, you won, and I understand you're not all that bad, and would you be, uh, <laughs> would you be willing to come on over and have, have lunch with me at the Democratic Club in Washington? So we did, and uh, it was really very helpful for me as a new member to make that connection and get someone that I could ask some questions about who is this guy and what's going on and so on. Uh, uh, I hope Dave would tell you, just for the fun of it, what life was like for a freshman member of the U.S. House of Representatives in uh, 1969 when uh, he suddenly arrived on the scene and ran into all the old bulls who had been there mm -hmm. for 30 years and who ran the roost uh, uh, in both parties. But anyway, Dave. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, let me say a couple things before I start. Number one, people from Fond du Lac need to understand I have a long-standing grudge against Fond du Lac. When I was in the second grade, I was madly in love with Mary Constance Kellenhofer. And her parents had the temerity to often leave Wausau and move to Fond du Lac, and I never forgave them for it. <laughs> the second thing I would simply say is that the, the very first political event of any import that I ever attended uh, was the state young democratic convention, which was held in Fond du Lac in 1958. That's when I first became, uh, became involved. So I'm a, I'm happy to be here again today. I'm especially happy to be here uh, with, with Tom Peacock. Gaylord Nelson was indeed my mentor. I, I, I almost worshipped him. I think he's one of the most decent people I've ever known and one of the most imaginative. And as some of you may know, uh, Gaylord and Tom once ran against each other for the United States Senate. And Gaylord told me one night that he thought that Tom Petri was the most decent person who had ever run against him. So uh, I think that's an accolade which is uh, worth advertising because it symbolizes, a, or it spells of a kind of a man uh, uh, Tom is. 
He's also one of the most innovative members of the Congress, uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, which at the time it was adopted was a, was a non-controversial uh, alternative to a, the increase in the minimum wage. Uh, it was regarded then as the conservative solution to a problem, which interests me today when I see some conservatives attack the earned income tax credit, which is one of the most sensible and just programs on the books as far as I'm concerned. We also had the privilege of working for years on, uh, on transportation issues. Uh, Wisconsin for many years was what was, was what was known as a, a donor state which meant that we sent more money to Washington for highways than we got back. When Tom uh, rose to a position of prominence on the uh, Transportation Committee, <coughs> he led the way in correcting that, so that for the first time in, in decades, Wisconsin got back roughly the same amount that uh, it, sent, it, it, it sent to Washington. And he continues to offer a, a that kind of pragmatic uh, representation to the uh, people of this district and I'm happy to be here with. Um, if we're going to talk about Congress and how it's changed, I think we have to put it in some context. And I think we have to look at how uh, the country itself has changed from, from the beginning uh, so that we understand when people ask how politics has changed, we need to understand how what politics has been asked to accomplish has changed over the years. Um, in, uh, from 1789 until uh, just a few years before the Civil War, uh, the main job of the government was to defend the uh, shores and to, uh, uh, and to determine the right relationship between the states and the central government. Uh, we fell out of uh, agreement on the latter issue Back in the 1850s, we had a civil war, and the U.S. Army, uh, uh, the Union Army, uh, settled uh, that difference and uh, defined ever since that point roughly the relationship between the states and the uh, and the central government. Um, from 1865 until roughly the 20s, uh, the federal government uh, saw as its main responsibility simply uh, assisting in the effort to move the country, expand the country westward, and to, and to develop uh, the economy of the country working hand in hand, uh, often with, uh, with, uh, with uh, business interests, uh, railroads, you name it, uh, to trying to build a modern country with a modern infrastructure. Um, from after the Great Depression in 1929, we had uh, a change in attitude. And the government began to get very much more involved in efforts to make life safer and more secure for average working people. And so you saw employment compensation, you saw social security, you saw programs like that, that uh, in essence built a safety net under uh, the vast majority of people in the country. Um, then we uh, moved on under under uh, Lyndon Johnson and saw Medicare adopted, uh, federal aid education really uh, got going under, under Kennedy and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Johnson. What Eisenhower built the uh, 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 highway system and, uh, and people's expectations all the while uh, had grown about government. And people were fairly optimistic about government. When I entered politics in '62, by the way, for the legislature for the first time, people were upbeat about politics. They were upbeat about the country. They uh, uh, they were, I think, infected by the optimism that you would see in people like Hubert Humphrey and, and Jack Kennedy. <coughs> and uh, uh, that's the atmosphere in which I got elected to the legislature. That rapidly changed after that, starting with Jack Kennedy's assassination and with the turmoil in the South over civil rights. Uh, the mood of the country changed. Then we moved into the Vietnam era, and 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 uh, the public's attitude turned from uh, from indifference to uh, a downright hostility toward many actions of the federal government, and. Uh, 
people began to really doubt whether or not they could count on the government to uh, do the right thing, I think. And if you take a look at the Gallup poll uh, back in uh, 1960 and compared to what, uh, to what it was uh, 30 or 40 years later, you see that uh, uh, public support or uh, public confidence in the government itself has largely collapsed over that period. And I think there are a lot of substantive reasons why, which we can get into later in the program. But uh, uh, along with all of these changes in the country and in the psyche of the country, also came uh, changes in the way the Congress did business. When I was elected uh, to uh, Congress, there were no national consultants to speak of in House races. Uh, occasionally, you would have a House member who had a pollster, but most members uh, uh, made their decisions uh, on instinct. Some of them had polls, but at most they would run one poll a year, a very short poll, and uh, it, didn't, it didn't tell you a whole lot about uh, the public uh, uh, view in depth. Um, uh, there was no permanent campaign. When I was first elected, you could count on having the first year be relatively bipartisan so that you could get some things done before the election in the second year of the cycle be, uh, began to infect the operation. Um, there, as Tom said, there was no camera. Uh, in those days, uh, speeches given by members were largely aimed at persuading other members who were on the fence on issues or on the, on the side of their own shore. Today, if you watch members, and nine times out of ten, their heads up, they're looking at the camera instead of looking at, at their peers on the floor. And they are, uh, uh, they're, they're aiming their remarks at the C-SPAN audience or at their political base in that audience rather than uh, at the uh, undecided members of uh, the chamber. Um, most members are much less accountable to the public than they were in those days because uh, of the reapportionment, which has created more and more and more safe seats uh, with, with uh, I would say, less than, less than, certainly less than 75 truly competitive health seats, uh, and, and maybe even, even, even less. Um, money. When I was elected to Congress the first time, I spent $45,000. My opponent spent $65,000. In the last election, the election in my district cost over $12 million. Uh, that's just a little one example. Um, if you, and, and, and there were many other changes. 300 newspapers across the country today have reduced or eliminated their coverage of uh, Capitol Hill because the internet has totally changed the economic of the, the situation, and they made it hard for newspapers to survive. The Milwaukee Sentinel, before it merged with the Milwaukee Journal, eliminated their Washington Bureau. They eliminated it so they could put the money that they had spent on that bureau into publishing Packer Plus, which is nothing but a regurgitation of puff articles on the Packers that, uh, that had uh, run previously in the paper. And then uh, the Sentinel continued to give us lectures about standards uh, after, after they did that. Uh, TV coverage came as well. Uh, it was mentioned that, that uh, people self-select their news these days. Uh, I always shorthand it by saying if people are liberal, they watch uh, CNB, CSNBC. If they're conservative, they watch Fox. And if they don't know what they are, they watch CNN. And, uh, and so people never have their own views challenged by what they see on television news. They have their own biases reinforced by, by, by watching a, a news program that express agreement with their already held views. That doesn't help the country very much to sort out complicated problems. Um, let's see if I can check my prism notes here a bit. Um, the place is much more partisan. 
And uh, I think this goes in cycles in terms of who I blame. In, my, in the early years when I was there, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. And I would say that what I call the haters, that's probably too strong a word, but about one quarter of the members who were opposed to Vietnam were so angry about that war that they hated Richard Nixon, they hated Lyndon Johnson, they hated congressional leadership. And, uh, and even if you agreed with them, and I, well, I was a strong opponent of Vietnam, but even if you, this, even if you agreed with them on the ill-advisability of that war, if you had a different strategy to accomplish a change, somehow you were morally defective. You had to march in lockstep on everything, or somehow you were a moral failure. That's the way the left behaved in those days. Most of those people are now gone. And they've been replaced by, by, by the same craziness on the right. And uh, if, if you also add into that, at the same time, uh, there, are, there are many members who are, I mean, there, there are uh, many fewer members who have any real experience in the art of governance. You remember a few years ago, people used to talk about term limits. Now, understand, almost 40% of the House members serving this year have served less than two and a half years. So they have very little opportunity uh, to, to provide the House with any institutional member. And the majority of members of the Senate, I quote, are in their first term. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And yeah. so the idea of, uh, I mean, let me tell you, if you are a, and I have a lot of respect for people who work in government agencies, uh, politicians often cheap shot people and talk about them pointy-headed bureaucrats. But the fact is that, uh, that most of them work very hard and know their stuff. But if you are a, the head of a department and you don't want to be interfered with by the Congress, even though the Congress is elected and you're not, it is an awful lot, it's a lot easier job to bamboozle somebody on Capitol Hill if they've only been there two or three years and have just now found the direction to the menu. Uh, I mean, that, that is just a huge difference in the way Congress works. And, and, and there's another uh, huge change. Uh, when I went to Congress, most members would take their families with them to Washington when they went. And that meant they would come home about one weekend out of two or three. And the other weekend they would spend in Washington. And they would, they, they, they would socialize with each other. We used to go out to Dick Bowling's house and we had uh, 15 or 20 Republicans and 15 or 20 Democrats. We really got to know each other. We got to like each other. And, uh, and uh, uh, that has now changed because the schedule itself has changed. When I went to Congress, we were in session four days a week. Uh, today, it's about a day and a half. They come in Tuesday at, at 6.30. And this isn't just because of uh, uh, the Republican Congress. I mean, it was almost the same when my party was running it a couple of years ago. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, uh, they come in Monday, uh, they come in Tuesday, usually about uh, 6, 6.30 for vote. Then they're in session a full day on Wednesday. And by 2 o'clock on Thursday, they're knocking on the leader's door wanting to get out of town so they can take their airplane. When that happens, not only do you not get to know the people you work with, you also don't get to know the subject at hand. And if you don't develop a sense of pride that comes from developing a, a, a strong uh, understanding of substance, and if you had never really grasped the guts of the substantive issues, then what do you rely on in order to make judgments on, on, on issues? You rely on the politics of the issue. And that makes it so much easier for outside forces to, uh, to, to, to simply uh, polarize the Congress by the demands that they make on Congress every day. And so, uh, those, and, and then Tom mentions a very key uh, 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 difference. When I came to Congress, 
and this is technical, and I, I apologize for that, but you need, you need to understand it. The way the house works is when it is in what is called the full house, you have to have a quorum to proceed, which is much larger than, uh, than you can usually get. Because members are busy in their offices, they're busy in committees, they, they may be down town working with an agency, they're not sitting on the floor every day during all of the debate. So the Congress a long time ago adopted a process called working in the committee as a whole when they are uh, when they are considering a bill in the amendment process. And when that bill is subject to amendment, we have adopted the fiction of the Congress being in a committee to consider those amendments. And the quorum for that is much lower. That's why, why, why we do it. The rules used to be that the only time you could get a roll call on an amendment is if that amendment had passed on either a voice vote or a teller vote during the consideration of the, uh, of the bill in the amendment process. A teller vote was simply uh, Everyone who voted yes would march through two people standing there and they would be counted. And then people who were against the motion would march through the arch and people would be counted again. And, uh, and if, if an amendment passed, then uh, usually the bill manager, when it returned to the House floor, would ask for a re-vote. And on that vote, you would get a roll call vote. But when we changed the rules and went to the machine that Tom was talking about, we also changed uh, the process. And uh, right now, any special interest group in the country can get somebody to offer an amendment that is a gotcha amendment. It's not designed to win a vote. It's designed to embarrass the political opponent. And then the campaign committees take that vote and they stick it on a half-truth television ad, and they fill people with bold uh, and, and, and that has really, in my view, been a, uh, an unanticipated and very unfortunate consequence of the efforts that, uh, that, that were made in the 70s to open up the process to make it more democratic. It became more open, but at the same time, more subject to the lowest common denominator practice that somebody was willing to engage in. And that has also hurt, to, hurt the system. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, the good old days were the good old days, because Tom wants to, I, I know the story Tom wants to tell. <laughs> That's a good so one. forgive the language ahead of time, okay? <laughs> Especially since it is now the time to leave. But uh, uh, when I first went to Congress, my office was in 1417 along this building. And I noticed that right across the hall was an empty room that seemed never to be used. I had two rooms that were together, and then the third room in my office was way down the hall, around the corner and down in, 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 in the far corner of the building. And I desperately wanted to find a way to consolidate my staff. So I finally asked Carl Albert, who was the, uh, the uh, majority leader at the time. I said, Carl, who has this office? He said, well, I'm not supposed to tell you. It's supposed to be secret uh, between the speaker and, uh, and the uh, But he checked it out, and he said, it's Wayne Hayes. I didn't know who Wayne Hayes was. I soon found out. I called him, uh, and he answered. I said, Mr. Chairman, and I explained what I, what I wanted. I said, I'm wondering whether there's any chance that you would be willing to swap rooms so that I could consolidate my staff. He said, I'll be right over. I said, gee, that's nice of it. So he came over, walked into my office. He said, Ken, come with me. I want to show you something. And he pulled out about 50 keys in his pocket, went across the hall, opened the door, and in that room, from ceiling to floor was crated French furniture. And he said to me, now, look, he said, I go over the North Atlantic Assembly twice a year, and we fly on an Air Force plane. And on the way back, I bring this furniture back, and I'm storing it here until I'm finished building my house 
and still be there. <laughs> now he said, you wouldn't want me to take a chance on scratching it to do a favor for some chicken shit freshman, would you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, sir. <laughs> That's the way things were. They were uh, some of those, uh, some of those uh, old old boys were just uh, impulsive, and now they're largely gone. So there have been a lot of changes, some for the good, some for the better, some for the worse. Politics itself, I think, has become a lot nastier. Dave, can I interject and, one second? Yeah. I think you made a really good point because the seniority system was in effect for a long time. If I'm not mistaken, Carl Albert served for 57 years. Is that the one from Arizona? No, 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 no. no, no. Well, no, Carl Hayden. No, that Hayden. was Carl Hayden. No, Carl, Carl Albert was, was, uh, was uh, from Oklahoma. That's right. And Wayne Hayes got notoriety later from Ohio. Yeah. From Ohio. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I mean, I think there are other reasons why why, why uh, the public has such substantial privacy. And I think really that's related to the fact that for the last 30 years we've had a steady increase in income disparity in this country and a steady decline of middle income family income. I mean middle class family income. And uh, so I think today people look at government and they say, well, uh, how good a job have you done in, in, in making an opportunity for a better life for me and my family? And I think that's where the really find the system wanting. And uh, until we correct that, it doesn't matter what we do about the process of the government, uh, we're not going to have uh, uh, a government that is very popular with very many people. Okay. Um, thank you very much. At this time, we'll take some questions. Um, if the intern want to bring the questions, everybody should write their questions and then on a piece of paper. Okay. Well, that's that's going on. One one thing I might mention, I think it's true in both political parties in the in the house. Uh, and Dave might want to comment on that too. But I do think over the period that you served, and certainly in the last year, the, the actual, uh, if you want to say raw ability, not necessarily political ability, but uh, accomplishments uh, and so on, of people who are elected to the House, it has gone up. We have a lot of doctors now. We've got a lot of uh, university people, a PhD or two, uh, who are professors. Uh, there are many people who are uh, doing it often at considerable sacrifice to themselves or their families or to their careers because they really do want to try to, to uh, uh, help make this a, a wonderful country. And, and that's true in both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, uh, the trouble is, if they're only there for two or three years and they don't get to know each other, and they're just sort of in shock almost for a year and a half if they haven't been in the state legislature, it's hard for, for people to figure out how to get out of the campaign mode and all that and into the being a productive legislator. And I think there's one other problem which I forgot to mention. Uh, uh, Andy Cohut uh, just published uh, for, for the Pew operation. They published uh, a poll of the American people. And that poll shows that the country itself is becoming more and more polarized. And the, 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 the core supporters for each party are becoming more and more apart in terms of their attitudes on issues. Just one number. Uh, I'm reading from this uh, poll article. 25 years ago, 62% of Republicans and 79% of Democrats, these aren't politicians, this is the general public, uh, said that the government should take care of people who can't take care of themselves. Today, 75% of Democrats agree with that statement, but the percentage of Republicans who agree has plummeted to 40%. Uh, the shift among environmental issues has been even greater. In 1987, 93% of Democrats and 86% of Republicans said there should be stricter laws 
and regulations to protect the environment. In the latest survey, Democratic support is unchanged, but among Republicans, it has plunged to 47 percent. Um, so when the country itself is very much more polarized, then it is hard not to see that same polarization reflected in the people they elect to public office. Can you name one or two political leaders from the House or the Senate or even from the White House that you admire and why? And, and if, especially if you've worked with them already. Well, I can name, I, I, mm -hmm. uh, the number I admire in the House of Representatives, uh, uh, <coughs> Dave might not necessarily agree on this, uh, is a fellow named Jim Cooper, who's a very able person. He's somewhat, been somewhat controversial within his caucus. But I, I think he's someone that uh, I think highly uh, of uh, the uh, 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 had the chance to serve with Tom Colburn, who is a very interesting uh, person. He is very strong, very iconoclastic. He'll go after Republican sacred cows and Democratic sacred cows, and it's kind of refreshing. Uh, he gives a speech uh, that goes on for about half an hour with a lot of specifics about waste and defense spending, <laughs> for example. Uh, and he uh, is a very conservative representative from Oklahoma. So those are a couple I would, I would mention, one in each, each party. Okay. Well, whenever I used to be asked by the press who I thought was the most qualified person in the Senate to be president, I would always say Dick Luger despite the fact that he was a conservative Republican. And I said that because uh, I used to attend these Aspen Institute conferences. And, and uh, through the years, Dick Luger did the same thing. I would never have known him uh, except through those conferences. And through the years, I got to really appreciate the way his mind worked, the way he dealt with other people. He was called, uh, when Richard Nixon was president, Nixon called him his favorite mayor. When Luger was, was mayor of Indiana, or in Indiana. And uh, he, he, he came to the Congress, became the senior Republican on Foreign Affairs Committee, and I think had the most textured understanding of foreign policy issues of uh, virtually anybody in the Senate. Um, in the House, I would simply say Nancy Pelosi. Uh, without Nancy Pelosi, we would not have passed that health care reform bill. Because at one point, I think uh, the, the president's political advisors were uh, ready to uh, settle for a much more restrained package. And, uh, and Nancy prevented uh, that bill from being shredded any more than it was shredded after nine months of Senate idiocy on the, uh, on the subject. Um, uh, the, the, uh, and she is the most tenacious and at the same time one of the most gracious people who I've ever worked with. And she never, never gives up. And I truly believe that she is the best speaker I ever served under. <coughs> I, I, I love Tip O'Neill. I thought Tip was a great politician. But I think Nancy has, saved, or has faced tougher times. One thing people don't appreciate about her, it's Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi. Yeah. Her dad, and I think maybe one her brother, uh, her dad was mayor of Baltimore, and her brother was in the House of Representatives, a very political family. And she, she married well and raised her family out in San Francisco, <coughs> and then got involved in politics when her, her family was, was involved a little bit, but not as a office holder until her children were basically growing up. But she comes from a very uh, a deep uh, political background. And it is amazing to me as a woman that she raised five kids, took the time to do all of that, and after they were all raised, then she got into politics on her own and rose to the very top. Well, since you mentioned health care and her role in it, one of the questions we have here, what are your views on government health care? 
My views on government health care. Or on health care in on general. Healthcare. Is it a right on or is it everyone's in individual well, responsibility? I was thinking as Dave was talking about that, and it wouldn't have happened without Nancy Pelosi. The jury is still out, actually, on that. Uh, it, uh, an awful lot of companies and individuals are meeting uh, federal agencies, others struggling to try to figure out the framework and how this is really going to work. I think it's going to be, uh, probably could be fairly disruptive for the next six months or a year until it shakes down, uh, but uh, uh, time, will, time will tell. There's a lot of, maybe there, we'll see if there are some efforts to, uh, to try to uh, make some mid-course corrections in the, the legislation was not a really finished final piece of work. Uh, people who were whether for it or against it would concede that it, it ended up being rushed through without going to a conference committee for a variety of reasons. And there's, there are glitches uh, in it. <coughs> uh, I know that, for instance, the uh, 30 hour, they, they define 30 hours a week as full time. Normally it's 40 hours a week as a full time job, 30 hours under health care and 50 or more employees of 30 hours or more, and then you're under the basic framework of the health policy, I guess you're supposed to be providing. A lot of people in the retail, quick trip uh, sort of sector are trying to figure out how that's going to really work. Now, I don't know if some of them probably don't have insurance, others do, and whether they're going to be able to keep it or how that's, there's going to be a lot of disruptions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm biased. I was in the chair presiding over the House when we passed the bill, and so I, uh, I'm proud of that. Uh, I always told that when people would ask me, uh, I'll be uh, restricted to when, when you're going to leave, and my response would be, the day you pass health care, I'm happy to be out of here. And I did. Um, so I, uh, I, I, I figured 48 years is enough for anybody. But um, uh, let me put it this way. I grew up in a family that had this experience. My father went to the hospital for an appendix operation. He came back paralyzed. He could not use his arm. Uh, and we thought our economic future was over. And we were lucky because gradually he regained the use of his arm. To this day, we don't know what happened. Um, but we were that close to economic misery when I came home from the hospital. And I am uh, uh, unapologetic on the fact that we, under that bill, we'll see about 30 million more people with health insurance and have it today. I think it was a moral abomination that, uh, that anyone in this country uh, uh, who needed health care could not get it except by going to an emergency room, which is the most expensive way to get health care in this country. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a perfect bill. It certainly isn't. And as Tom says, we will, we will need adjustment as, as this thing kicks in. But, uh, the fact is, when, when, when people say that uh, this is government-run health care, in my view, that's a bunch of hoorah. The fact is that the very first decision we made was not to have this be a government-dominated health care plan. The very first decision we made was to insist that we hang on to the private system which delivered most health care through private insurance companies. And, uh, and, 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 and so all of the concessions that were made afterwards were made in the context of trying to keep this uh, as much as possible a, a, a system where you got your insurance from private companies. We just wanted some rules in the game so that people were protected on cost on access and the rest, and uh, uh, that's 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 what they, they, they tried to do. That was it was not my preference. I would have preferred a single payer plan. I would prefer to go 
much further than we did. But in the end, uh, uh, politics is the art of uh, a compromise as obviously an alternative. So um, uh, there is one of my concerns. When we pass the bill, we put a significant amount of money in that bill in order to help states implement those health care changes that are coming to play. Um, the problem that we have is that some 20 governors have decided that they are not going to participate and under the law that means the feds are required to come in and, and, and set up this thing. The problem is while we put a lot of money in for, for, uh, for uh, states to implement that, that uh, change, we didn't put a lot of money in for the feds to implement that change. And so the administration asked for a billion dollars because they now had I think the purpose of our billion dollars was to engage in outreach so you, so you could explain to people what the, uh, how this change works, what, uh, what uh, subsidies uh, you might be eligible for, um, uh, and, and, and explain to people how they fit in. But the, uh, the Congress denied the administration that money. And because they denied the administration that money, you are now going to have this problem. Uh, the people who are the sickest will, will manage to find a way to get to those exchanges because they will have a huge economic incentive to do so. But those who are younger and not as sick will not have the same motivation to try to find out how these exchanges work. And as a result, uh, those exchanges can be skewed uh, in the direction of having uh, mostly people with the most expensive problems in those programs under this scheme. And that will raise the cost of, of, uh, of providing health care under those exchanges because you won't be able to balance out uh, the big bills from the sickest with the smaller bills for, for, from the, the more, the more well-off. That's the consequence of the uh, of uh, the Congress, in, in my view, making a big mistake, and the governor um, uh, not recognizing what, uh, what, what, what they're doing to the system by refusing to set it up. So, uh, as Tom says, the jury's still out on it, but uh, if I had to choose between uh, the system that, uh, that uh, this legislation would eventually produce and uh, the, the prior system where, where, where insurance companies uh, pretty much dominated the game and could be at the throat any time, I think the new deal. Okay, thank you. Uh, to progress from the Great Recession, economists recommended investment in infrastructure and education. <clears throat> Why does the House of Representatives instead vote repeatedly <clears throat> to follow the failed policies of Europe and demand austerity? Uh, good question. I, I guess uh, uh, the uh, actual national policy doesn't have much to do with the Congress. It is something called quantitative easing, where basically the Federal Reserve is creating about a trillion dollars a year of money. I was talking to uh, one of the senior, Chuck Bauscher, who was head of the uh, uh, General Accounting Office, said one of our senior people. He said that's how we can ask World War II, basically. We basically just created the money and put it out there. And so we're, we're doing that, but we are struggling in Congress in infrastructure spending. There was a big dispute on the stimulus packages to whether there should have been more in that area or more stabilizing education in the states. And it basically was more stabilizing education in the states. Uh, but <coughs> I'm currently chairman of the Highway Committee, and we're desperately trying to see if we can't come up to, uh, on a, on, this is, there's not a partisan division on this, uh, to see if we can't come up with uh, a new highway bill, which is long overdue, that would adequately fund investment in our national infrastructure and provide a framework. To really do that, 
we've got to come up with some more money from some, somewhere. And uh, that's a, sort of a, the third rail of American politics, although that's starting to change because uh, in Dick Cheney country, Wyoming, uh, the state legislature is about 80% Republican, and they worked on it uh, for three or four years and just raised their gas tax by 10 cents a gallon uh, at the state level to meet some of their infrastructure needs. Same thing is happening in Virginia and a number of other states. I don't know at the national level if we'll uh, be able to work out some sort of a package to pay for the new infrastructure needs, but historically, we paid for it on a user fee basis, collecting money uh, every time you buy a gallon of gasoline, 18.3 cents is federal gas taxes, over 25, 30 cents is state taxes now. And same thing with diesel. Uh, that That is not working as well as it used to. Fuel, uh, company, cars are much more, and trucks are much more fuel efficient than they were. We're coming up with a lot of alternative <coughs> energy sources. So we're struggling to see if we can modernize this. And also, right now, only about, uh, the revenue only covers about 60% of what we're spending. And what we're spending is, uh, all the experts tell us, is not keeping up with uh, what we need to do to maintain our, our infrastructure. So we've got a big, big job, but I think at the end of the day, uh, the conservative responsible thing to do is if you need something, if you possibly can, figure out how to pay for it rather than put it on the tab for your kids. And that, that's what we're going to try to do. Well, um, Dave's worked on this for years, so oh, man. on the appropriation side of it. And the, let, me, and let me just ask a question. You were there when uh, the stimulus passed in February 2009. I wrote most of it. Right. $787 billion. I thought that, just from what I know from the Great Depression era, Obama made the same mistake that Roosevelt made. Not enough money. 787 seems like a lot. He had the political majority. I, I'm just, I was just wondering why if there wasn't more input that um, well, World War II got Roosevelt out of it and 787 me, wasn't close to. Let me, um, let me respond to two points. First on education and then on that. And again, we should be talking about Congress too. <laughs> we're yeah. getting into, we're quickly drifting off into a food I can say this. But it, but it, what it comes down to is what the role of government is, and what yeah. you know the yeah. the Democrats for and the, and the stability of the, of the process and people education. not uh, sandbagging people in the course of it. Yeah. Okay. The um, I confess I'm not against it. Every single person in Congress and every single person in this country has biases based on their own value and their own life experience. So I don't pretend to be neutral on anything. That doesn't mean I'm off in some weird place um, because I am a practitioner. But on education, I just want to make this observation. We have to ask ourselves how many more years we are going to continue to underfund education, especially higher education. Uh, and I'm going to give you one set of numbers. If you take the best performing eighth graders in the country, academically, and then divide them by family income into different groups, what you will see is if that high performing eighth grader is from the richest 20% of families in this country. They have a 74% chance of graduating from a four-year university. If they are exactly in the middle of the income stream, they have a 47% chance of graduating from a four-year university. And if they are in the bottom 20%, they have a 29% of graduating from a four-year university. So if anybody tells you that we are an equal opportunity society when it comes to education, you can quote me as saying they're not. Because it isn't true. I wish it were. 
And that's why it is so important um, that we have the right sort of priorities when, uh, when, when uh, we make those decisions. On, on the stimulus package, um, as chairman of the Appropriations Committee, it was my responsibility to write the spending part of that bill. And I had a lot of arguments with everybody, including the White House. And all I could, uh, you're right, $787 billion sounds like a lot of money. But, but how you view that depends upon the, uh, you, you, the kind of economic theory that you really believe in. And I believe that what the Great Depression showed is that the country uh, was in the golden largely for two reasons. One, because the Federal Reserve did not respond by having expansionary policy at that time. And secondly, because uh, uh, consumption collapsed in the economy, and people simply didn't have enough money to buy anybody else's goods and services. And so uh, they had a long and protracted uh, 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 recession. Roosevelt made a mistake in my view because in 1937 the unemployment levels had started to go down significantly. And so Roosevelt thought, aha, the worst is behind us. And so he throttled back on government stimulus uh, funding in the budget, and as a result, uh, the economy slipped into another nosedive. And it took another two years for it to recover. And then World War II came along, the mother of all job programs, and that took care of the unemployment part. So then people were employed on Okinawa and Guadalcanal. Um, and I think that, I think that we failed to learn the lesson, the lesson of Roosevelt's mistake in 37. Which is why when the stimulus package was first brought to us by the White House, um, I frankly, I was told by Larry Summers, who has been the president's principal economic advisor, that the package should be a trillion four in order to be big enough. It isn't so much that it needed to be bigger, but it needed to be sustained for a year or two more. Right. Um, and it wasn't because Obama made a judgment that, he, that that was the most he could get. Rahm Emanuel asked me, he said, uh, gee, don't you think that a trillion dollars is, uh, uh, it, 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 isn't that going to put a sticker shock and are we going to have trouble passing it? I said, you bet. But you need that sticker shock so that the public understand just how big and how serious this problem is. And uh, in the end, the White House had to make a choice that they couldn't get the vote for a package that was any bigger. And so like everything in life, you do what you can do at the time, uh, and then you try to come back for more. The problem is I had told the White House that in my judgment, they'd better ask what they needed for the first time because they weren't going to have a chance of a snowball in hell of getting it second time around. Because members were not going to stick their necks out twice for that kind of spending package when uh, the public didn't understand. And we were handicapped by the fact that when the public was asked by the pollsters, you support the stimulus, people didn't think we were talking about that bill. They thought we were talking about the bailout of Wall Street. That's what they meant when they heard talk about the stimulus. So we were, we were killed by a bad labeling, uh, bad salesmanship, and by limited vision, in my view. Thank you. Since we're here to talk about Congress, too, I want to go back to a question. Uh, what specific changes would you suggest we make in Congress to make our political climate healthier? In terms of the polarization that was mentioned, the lack of compromise, what could we do if you had the power to uh, make one, the change? One, what would one you change would be to allow the uh, committees to work in their areas of responsibility. Uh, the fact is that an awful lot of what is being done in Congress is being driven on a day-to-day -day basis by polls and by ha having to 
sort of engage in this continuous political debate. And so legislation, whether it was ready or not, is plucked from the Committee of Jurisdiction by the leadership of one party or the other and put on the floor in often a half-baked fashion. And we get poor quality legislation and it just uh, doesn't, it's not a very good way to, to uh, run the railroad, I don't think. I understand why they're doing it and it's, it's being done by both it was Republicans and Democrat leadership have both uh, uh, played this game. Dave was involved in it somewhat as a committee chairman. Very frustrating. Uh, when you, he, he, when he first took office, he took great pride in getting his all 13 appropriation bills for the first time in 43 years through the process of signing the law. And th that was the hope that the committee would function and do its job. It ended up, uh, partly because of the economy and all the disruption, but also uh, got buffeted uh, by, by uh, a leadership uh, uh, influences, in my opinion. That's exactly right. Uh, the, 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 uh, to me, the way the Congress is supposed to work is that the leadership of both parties, let's talk for a moment about the leadership of the majority party, because the majority party runs the joint. Uh, let's say, the, the way I believe it ought to work is that the party leadership has a responsibility to lay out what its program is. They have a responsibility to go to their congressional committee and tell them what they would like to see produced <coughs> and on what, on what time frame. But then, instead of being totally dictated by those at the top, that policy direction, that those policy orders need to be leavened and refined and massaged by substance as people in the committees of jurisdiction <coughs> with uh, experience dealing with these issues as, as, as committee members bring their knowledge to bear to refine that legislation so that it will make more sense the first time it encounters reality. And the problem we have is that today the leaders uh, do not give sufficient attention to the knowledge that people develop over time in the committee. And, I mean, committees, knowledgeable committees, if they've done their work, held their hands, and other staff work. They can, they can keep leadership out of trouble if the leadership will just listen. Um, and, 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 uh, I, I, I'm proud, proud to say that with, with, uh, with, with, with Nancy Pelosi, she would come to me and she would tell me what she wanted in a bill, and I would try to accommodate it. But if I thought it was wrong, I would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her and with her staff, and to her credit, she never ordered me to do anything that I told her I thought was a mistake. If she had, I would have resigned. I threatened to resign once when Jim Wright was there. Uh, he didn't like what I'd done when I was chairman of the Foreign Operations Subject. So, so I think the key element that you have to have in Congress is pride. If you have pride in your work, if you have pride in the quality um, of that work and pride in the work your staff has done to prepare you for, for, for whatever fight you've got that day, that, that day, then you're going to have a product in the end that is much more focused on substance uh, and much less on politics. But if the leaders simply say, oh, shorthand, we've got to have this done by Thursday, here's what we're going to do, then you're going to have some inexperienced staffers um, make some big mistakes. And I'll tell you something, the staff of the committees of jurisdiction, who should be the people in the room making sure you don't do dumb things, those people, if they are not involved, they're going to do their best to let the press know how you screwed up. 
And so that's um, what you need to take advantage of the professionalism of people in that institution. I mean, if you go to a doctor, you don't go to a doctor who looks good on television because you had three weeks experience. You go to the best professional you can find. You need to do the same thing in politics. And <coughs> so does the leadership. Uh, I mean, they, you, you want strong leaders because the Congress <coughs> is an amazingly immobile institution at times, especially the Senate, which has been malfunctioning for years. But, but uh, uh, you, 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 need, you need strong leadership to push through, but, but leaders also have to listen to them. What would you each tell students here that are looking maybe for a career in politics, but they're a little bit leery because of the polarization, because of the money? What kind of advice or what kind of uh, <coughs> suggestions could you offer to our future leaders here? Well, it's what you're, no one wants to hear. First, do your homework and do a good job at what your principal job is. Second, I would do a lot of reading. Third, I would get involved if I could in other people's campaigns or uh, you learn a lot from other people's mistakes, and it's mm -hmm. less painful than when you do it yourself uh, mm -hmm. directly. Uh, and then you, you see if that's for you or not. That's one of the reasons these internships are a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think they're helpful for a lot of different reasons because you're you're interacting in, uh, suddenly in a world with with constituents and talking to them on the telephone and with with visiting firemen and all the rest of it. And I think it's good good experience, good life experience to start knowing how to deal with the, with the public in those sort of, sort of jobs. And the other thing is I, I, I would think it makes sense to uh, recognize that there are hundreds of jobs in politics, both as a candidate and as the office holder, that really aren't in the spotlight that much, but are very important uh, at, at the county level, city level, other level. Uh, if you have the time or interest, it uh, uh, doesn't hurt to get a few, few uh, younger people uh, uh, involved. That track is probably a plus. I think they, they would welcome having, uh, having a, a little different perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I was in politics all of my life because, uh, largely because of a man by the name of Ralph Hewitt. He was a political science professor at the University of Madison. I transferred to Madison as a junior. And uh, I was in political science. And, and my high school history teacher told me the one man you want to get as an advisor, if you can, over the down there, is, is Ralph Hill. He said he's one of the best political scientists in the country. So I paid him a visit the first day I was on the campus. And I asked him, uh, what is his life to be if I wanted to have some kind of a career in politics? And I, I didn't think I would ever be in elected politics. I was thinking, well, maybe I could wind up being a staffer for a mayor or, or, or something like that. And what he told me is, uh, well, he said, uh, from your comments, I take it you're a Democrat. Yep. He said, well, then what you ought to do is that you will learn a lot in my class if you take one of my classes. You will learn a lot in other classes. But you'll learn the most if you simply get involved with the young Democrat. Because you said, you need to understand how politics work. You, you'll get some governance here, but you need to understand how politics work. And so um, I walked over to the student union. I signed up for uh, John Young Republicans. We peddled literature uh, all over campus. Uh, that's how I met Bill Steiger, because Bill, Bill was doing the same thing uh, a year ahead of me uh, on the Republican side of the aisle. And uh, so I wound up in 1960, when I was a senior, 
uh, running Hubert Humphrey's campaign on campus in the primary against Jack Henry. Yeah. And uh, we got beat. <laughs> but uh, 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 I learned how you campaign. I went down to party headquarters. I stuffed envelopes. I distributed literature. I, 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 I did uh, some political research for the Democrats in the state legislature. I did anything anybody asked me to do. And uh, in fact, I'll even tell you a, a, a story. Sometimes the biggest fights you have are between people in the same party. And in, uh, during that presidential primary, Pat Lucy, who later became governor, was the state party chairman in 1960. And he was passionately for Jack Kennedy. And I was for Hunter. And so were most of the young guns on campus. And I got a phone call one day from Pat Lucy, and Pat said, Dave, I know you guys are all on the other side, but would you do a favor I said, what's that? He said, we've got 175,000 newspaper inserts that have just been delivered. They're sitting on Ivan Westerman's lawn. He was there in Madison. They're sitting on, his, on the boulevard on his lawn, and it's raining. And those things are going to get soaked. Would you mind, as a favor, could you roll up some young guns and put that stuff in the garage? Why didn't you? Well, we want to save the literature that uh, that our opponent would have cut in our feet. And uh, you know, through that, I got to know Pat Lucy, and you know, we were very good friends for years before I was uh, before I was in the elected politics. So I would just say, if you're interested in government, first of all, in life generally, do what makes you happy. I mean, you only go through it once, and why should you go through it doing something you don't want to do, or something that doesn't turn you on? And do, at least try to do what you think will make you happy. And if you don't, can't make it, you know, big deal, even Babe Ruth got like 20 minutes time. So do what you can do, take a shot at it, you'll feel a hell of a lot better if you have a shot at it and miss than you will if you never tried it. That's great. You know, I, I just read Pat Lucy just turned 95. Yep. In Milwaukee. Yeah. Well, this concludes our dialogue on civic engagement. Please join me in thanking former Congressman Dave Obey and Congressman Tom Petri for being here tonight. Great job.